All right, hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is December 12th, 2024. Man, it is getting so exciting. I, we've got another exciting, exciting, in-depth, digging in, teaching tonight. It's so awesome. Anybody, I'll say up front, anybody who's behind on the teachings and just doesn't know where to start anymore, watch this one right here. It uh, is it a mirror? Oh, yes, it is. Then go to Taurus, Taurus, Taurus. Then he told us the well and the water bearer. Then all great truths begin as blasphemies. Watch one, two, three, four, and then this one, and you will be caught up. You will be understanding. You will you will be tracking. It's a lot to watch if you're behind. But my goodness, it it, it all turned right here. This was it. It's not that everything that came before it wasn't correct. It's the understanding that was needed to get us there because it's all the same count. It's all the same understanding. It's all the same revelation, but it is simply switched from spring to fall. And when you understand how that happened, why that happened, what it equaled, and everything that has come to be revealed since then, it is absolutely incredible. And... I was just shared, I think it was yesterday, and I just watched a, a video that was shared with me by our brother Jake. It was this in-depth teaching on the understanding of how to count the Jubilee and the, the Sabbath years and the, when to harvest and when you can harvest. It is incredible. But had I seen that teaching before we got here, I probably would have dismissed it because it talks about both beginnings of years and how to understand both in relation to the jubilee so it, it's something when you know it's like it's like when people come to the ministry here and they start hearing these things about who the gospels are speaking to and, and the 14 years and above and and it sounds all crazy and you're like this no we've been told for hundreds of years generation after generation this is what it is it's seven years it's matthew 24 and now you're telling me this is the revelation of all of the gospels all of the discourses, the synoptic of Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end will be Luke, Mark, Matthew, and that's why there's differences in the Gospels. And it means it's not one set of seven years, but two sets of seven years. And Luke's portion is, is a short time called above. Yep. It, it's so hard to understand it, but if you were led, if the Spirit is leading, if you pray over it, the Lord will reveal it to you. And you will be so excited because you will never read scripture the same again you will never read it with this confusion of who's being spoken to how and when well that's kind of what was happening with me as i was watching the video on the on the jubilee because i'm trying to track it he's got great little charts to explain it it's short and i watched it two three times and i rewound some of the other places like i know many of you guys do watching these teachings and it was awesome, and I'm going to study it some more and study it and really grab it and grasp it until that moment it clicks and fully clicks, and then I'm going to do a teaching on it. I've got another two, oh, no, four, maybe five teachings that are in the hopper behind this that I'm working on, that I've touched on, that I made little notes on here and there. Others i got to study some more. It is so exciting, guys. It is pouring out from everywhere. We've got the Gospels, the years, the Psalms, the prophets, the creations, the, 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 the prophecies of the, 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 all of it relating to the end of days, the open books. We've got the seven churches revealed. We've got the tribes in the, around the tabernacle in the wilderness and how they relate directly to the end of days. It is so exciting. It's, it, it's wild. It's so wild. And for anybody that's new before i fully get going into this for anybody that's new you heard me talk about some things just now like who the gospels are speaking to in 14 years what you want to do is you come to the playlist right here you go to ministryrevealed.com and click on the link uh uh in the menu that says intro series or intro and watch the first four teachings there or you can come right here on the playlist and watch the first four teachings 22 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, and the big one, the final one, is uh, 2 hours and 43 minutes. I promise you, it's worth every moment of your time. Everybody who has taken the time to watch them 
has absolutely been blown away and has come to understand prophecy as they have never seen it revealed before. I promise you it's that good. And that is only the beginning. 22 minutes is just the intro to the next three that are going to be spoken about. Give you a little taste of what's coming. The 30-minute Bible study of who the Gospels are speaking to will begin to show you why there's differences focused in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And once you see them, you, every single one of them we can show, we've shown dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens. They all mean something in the prophetic, not just the discourses, all throughout the Gospels. And what you find out is Matthew, Mark, Luke, the first will be last, the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end of days, goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. And when you see these differences, when you understand them, you're going to realize, wait a second, so then pre, mid, and post are all true? Yeah, you guessed it. There's a reason why people can point them out in scriptures. We can prove through Luke and Mark and Matthew that pre, mid, post are all true. But once you understand these differences in the Gospels, then you go to the third teaching, another 30-minute intro to the revelation of the 14 years and the short time above, you're going to see that the only reason people believe in seven years is because they've learned everything from the Gospel of Matthew. Once you realize who Mark is speaking to, then you see the other set of seven years. And once you understand Luke, you'll understand the short portion called above. I promise you, it is worth your time. It'll blow you away. And then the fourth video, which is a big one, it's called It's All Because of Matthew. And the reason that one is so important is it ties it all together. How on earth did we not ever see this before? The first number one answer is because it wasn't yet time to reveal it. The second answer is because we have all been taught for hundreds of years, generation after generation, from the Gospel of Matthew. So when, you, when your foundation is in the Gospel of Matthew, everything else you go to read and you see pre or you see mid or you see post and you debate with yourself and with others as to which one you believe, you can't quite resolve it because everything you're seeing is through the eyes of Matthew. That's where it all comes from. And because you see seven years, you're only seeing the seven years of tribulation, which is actually the seven years of trumpets, which goes to Matthew. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. There's another seven years that comes first, which are the seven years of seals. Those are to mark the world, the, the sleepy church that wasn't ready. And they'll go in the seventh year of tribulation. In the seventh year of seals is the great multitude rapture. The post, of course, is the end of the trumpets. That's the 14th year. And the pre is the only one, is Luke's, and it's the only one that happens first before anything else happens. And as we're going to get into tonight, because this is all about threes, it's the only one where the escape happens before one of the comings of the Lord. Wait, what? <clears throat> pre, mid, and post are all true? Everything is in threes. 777, seven, seven. 7,000, 7,000, 7,000 in a mystery we've revealed here. Um, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Beast or Antichrist, false prophet, Satan. It, it's everywhere. Okay? It is all over the place. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Or in the end, Luke, Mark, Matthew. It's everywhere. And that's what we're going to see tonight. This is the stuff that we're going to touch on. Because as we've proven that pre, mid, and post are all true, what we've also shown over the years is what I was just touching on is that we have also shown that there are three comings of the Lord in different forms, right? In different fashions. But they're not the pre, mid, and post timings. Meaning when the Son of Man is coming, in the above portion, in the midst of those 50 days, when he comes for 40 days, he's not coming to take out the bride. The bride is gone a week before. And then he comes back on the eighth day after that wedding. When he comes back at the end of the sixth seal on heavenly Mount Zion in the clouds, and the whole world is going, ah, that's not when he's going to gather the great multitude rapture. They'll come in a few months later. 
And then when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives at his post-trib, he's not gathering them back at the post-trib yet until he deals with that final year, that 14th year against all of the enemies. So the pre, mid, and post aren't connected to the three comings of the Lord. You see, we've shown the pre, mid, and post, right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I knew a man in Christ. This is a prophetic typology in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. This is the pre-trib going at the beginning of the 50 days, just as it's all about to start, the 50 days above at the 50 days before the 14 years. What happens to them? It's like a rapture, and they're being taken to the third heaven. Then I knew such a man, not the same man. This one was in Christ. This one's kind of, sort of. This is relating to the great multitude mid-trib rapture, and where are they going? Was caught up to paradise. Pre-trib, mid-trib, and then look what we see at the end. It says, behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you. This is his coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, but we know he doesn't gather them back from the wilderness until after he's destroyed the enemies. Pre, mid, post, and three comings of the Lord. Okay? Now, this is exactly the, 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 the stuff that we're going to talk on tonight, what we're going to touch in. I don't want to spend too much time in the stuff that we already know directly in relation to the Gospels, but I am going to go in it to make a point. So that you guys can see it and understand it for yourselves. It's all over the Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels, his pre, mid, and post coming, not as, like I said, not for the pre-trib, not for the mid-trib, not for the post-trib people. But at his comings a week after on the eighth day, at his coming at the end of seals before he gathers the great multitude, and at his coming at the end of trumpets before he gathers them uh, from where they were t flowing away to a place protected, okay? These, This is going to be about the three comings of the Lord in his different, quote-unquote, forms or fashions, however you want to say it, that we know he is coming as. We have known these for years. We've taught on them for years. But if you haven't seen the live show that we did in, for the last one, the last gathering was a, was a live show instead of just a regular teaching, and if you haven't seen it, or if you had seen it, but you weren't quite able to track what I was showing, this is going to be that culmination. And not only what I shared in there, but with even greater detail, with more connections. And what you're going to see before your very eyes is that the Lord himself not only told us when he said four months early, but the, the tribes... And their arrangement in the heads of the tribes of the four corners reveal the exact month of the year when the pre-trib is going and when the Son of Man returns after the wedding on the eighth day. The only question that remains is, is this really the 70th year, finally understood as we've counted it from Leviticus in relation to not Israel coming into the land, but from when they got Jerusalem in 1950. According to the Levitical count, this is the final year, and the year does go from a Nisan to Nisan ever since uh, Exodus chapter 12. All right? It's so exciting. It's so, so exciting. And when you see the, these, these other little pieces, uh, we're going to get to a piece in a little bit that our brother Orlando shared in uh, the forum. If you're, when you hear me talk about the forum, if you're new to the ministry and you want to join us, you can go to ministryrevealed.com. And from the menu, you can click forum. It'll take you five, 10 seconds. Doesn't cost you anything. About 13 people are registered in there and people sharing events, things going on around the world, Bible studies, prayer requests, all sorts of stuff going on in there with like-minded brothers and sisters. All right. <clears throat> so this was shared by Orlando in a little bit when we get to it. And it, it was awesome. It was awesome when you understand the revelation. And if you've been around at least for a little bit, you will, you will completely see it. 
and understand it for yourself. It's so exciting, guys. So let's get this going, and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. Remember, everything, it always plays out in threes. Okay? So let's go to Luke's discourse. I'm, I'm hopeful that it shows up clear enough on the screen so that within this conversation, I don't have to always go to um, eSword. But uh, Bible Gateway changed their, their font color. I don't know why. I sent them, I even sent them an email about it. I'm like, oh, what are you guys doing? So hopefully you guys, it shows up for you guys still. So as we know, in Luke's discourse, right here, it says, Watch ye therefore, Luke 21, 36, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the pre-trib verse of Scripture. There are others, but within the Gospels, this is it right here. This is the number one pre-trib right here. And look what it tells you. To escape all these things that shall come to pass. Well, according to Luke's discourse, that means you're going to escape everything from not only the conversation of he said unto them, nation against nation, against nation kingdom against kingdom, which is the beginning of the 14 years, but he also says, but before all these. This but before all these is when everything starts after the pre-trib group has been taken. And this portion that we call above 14 years is, we've revealed it for years, is a period of time that is 50 days long. I'm telling you guys, I'm, I'm thinking ahead as I'm talking to other pieces that pop into my mind that I'm, I've got planned for later. And it, it's incredible when you see it. Because we've shown in so many places, at least 10, 12 places, where it's the pre-trib of the seven-day wedding, and then bang, the Lord returns on the eighth day. Well, wait until you see where I'm going to show that to you in how the scripture is laid out in relation to the names of the 12 tribes. It is awesome. It's absolutely everywhere, and it's just another confirmation of the truth of what we've understood. It's the pre-trib, seven days, the Lord as the Son of Man is coming. On the eighth day, he's here for 40 days. <coughs> Excuse me. Then he's gone, the compassing about of Jerusalem happens, there's the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and then bang, Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed, not completely wiped off the map, but essentially wiped off the map for a little while, right? For a few years. And that's the beginning of the 14 years, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. It, the beginning was what we've been trying to understand within the revelation of it all, right? Well, then we see in Luke's discourse, after this conversation of but before all these, some of you will throw him into prison. We know that that's the remnant worker group. He's warning that Jerusalem is going to be compassed about. But then listen to what it says. <clears throat> We see in, uh, starting in verse 25, this is about the coming of the Son of Man for the 40 days that we're talking about here tonight. It's kind of the main portion of the focus, but not the only portion. It says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things that are coming on the earth. Remember what we were talking about, right? Men's hearts failing, looking at these things that are coming, probably the stones throw and it breaking up and falling around the earth. Um, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. You see, in the past, it was always a question. Your redemption draws nigh. So is this the redemption for everybody going pre-trib? Or is this when he returns on the eighth day for the remnant group that he held back as the priestly line that will serve him during seals and be with him for 40 days? And I always bounced back and forth for a long time. Now we know this is when he comes back for the remnant workers. He tells them at the beginning, right before the pre-trib, to be ready when he returns from the wedding and knocks. That when he returns, that they would open unto him and he will come and sit with them and serve them. This is that remnant group. This is him coming 
on that eighth day after the seven-day wedding has taken place. Okay? This is the coming of the Son of Man at his first end of days coming. The pre-trib has no coming of the Son of Man. The Son of Man isn't coming and saying, everybody up now. Okay? That's not what's coming. It's going to be a vanishing. It's going to be like Enoch. It's a vanishing. This is him coming for 40 days as the Son of Man, as he said he would, and they would be as the days of Noah, only representing the 40 days. This isn't as Matthew 24. This is as he said in Luke 17, it would be as the days of Noah, meaning he's coming for those 40 days during a time of water. Right? During a time of water. You're going to want to remember that one. So this is his coming for the 40 days within, after the wedding, so on the eighth day, so it's within those 50 days in the above portion. In Mark's discourse, <clears throat> we see a different story. It says, but in those days, after that tribulation, you didn't get that in Luke, did you? After that tribulation. So that means there's a specific tribulation that took place before there's another one, okay? After that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, plural. For those that haven't been around for a while, in Luke, it said, this, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the, in, sorry, in a cloud. It was singular. You see, the whole world's not going to see him coming in this cloud when he's coming as the Son of Man. Even when he comes here, what coming is this? This is the end of the first six years of seals when he comes at that seventh year. We'll show you where that is later as well, which is the end of the sixth year of seals. This is the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds, plural. And this word in really means in, so does Luke's. So this is his coming the second time at the end of six years of seals. Okay, to set things up and to destroy the enemies in that seventh year and then trumpet judgments begin. Okay, when we go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, look at what this says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Very different, right? This one's different. It's not after that tribulation. It's immediately after the tribulation of those days. It's the one that came after the one that was for Mark. And what do we see? Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Now this sounds like it's the same. Come on. This sounds like it's the same as the one from Mark, doesn't it? But if you've been around for a while, you know that this word in isn't actually the word in. And this only happens in Matthew. So for anybody that's new, I'm going to show this to you, making this point. Everything is in threes. Okay, there's three comings of the Lord. And we see it right here. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Coming out of the west, uh, doo -doo -doo the east. Here it is right here. Then the Son of Man coming in the clouds. This is the only time where the word in actually is the word on. But the one in Luke and the one in Mark are both the word in. Why is it going to be in the or on the clouds this time? Because this is when they're going to see him coming as lightning. This is when the whole earth will then see him coming as lightning from one end unto the other. When does this happen? at the beginning of the 14th year of tribulation. Okay? There's one, two, three. Well, let me show you another example of these three. We've talked about this one many times. It's an exciting one to teach on. We've shown why Luke has all of this conversation that comes first in Luke chapter 9 before what we read in Luke chapter 9, verse 28. In fact, let's start in verse 27. It says, But I tell you the truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death, hello, till they see 
the kingdom of God. This is the pre-trip. There's a pre-trip group that won't of people on the earth who are in Christ spirit filled, like like uh, Second Corinthians chapter twelve, the first group above fourteen years going to the third heaven. Those who are in Christ spirit filled, and it says the next thing they're going to see is the kingdom of God. And then what do we see? And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. This right here, and this is only found in Luke's story of the transfiguration. We have a teaching that shows the the first coming, second coming, third coming in the end of days of Messiah in the resurrection story, in the transfiguration story, and in the triumphal entry story. It's in that uh, playlist as well as you after you've watched the first four <clears throat> you can go in and discover those other ones. So, look at what we see. About an eight days after these sayings. Well, when have we been talking about the Lord coming back? After the seven-day wedding, he's coming back about an eight days. He's coming back on the eighth day to begin his 40 days. And what happened before that? A group of people that didn't see death or didn't taste of death until they see the kingdom of God. The next thing they're going to see, bam, the kingdom of God. That's the Enoch group. And this is the Lord coming in another prophetic typology layered into this, showing in Luke 9, the transfiguration story is a picture of the Son of Man coming on the eighth day to fulfill those 40 days. What happens when we go to Mark's discourse, uh, Mark's transfiguration story? Well, look at Mark 9, starting in verse 1. You don't have that big conversation of everything that happens first because when the Lord comes, it's right away after the six days, which is a prophetic typology of six years, something we've shared many times. Days can be years in prophecy. And it's really exciting because we've done teachings on this a while, quite a while back where the days can be years and we've shown it and proven it out in so many places. And the uh, transfiguration story is one of them, except there's places where the days haven't yet been fulfilled that in the end of days won't be years, but they're still days. But there are others where it was fulfilled in days. So in the end, they play out sometimes as years. It's wild when you understand it. So look at what Mark 9 says, starting in verse 1. Then said he unto them, Verily I say unto you that there be some some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen, past tense, the kingdom of God come with power. You see that? This is such an awesome study. I've, I've done this study in the past, right? This is just to make the point of the three comings of the Lord. And you could see the pre-mid post in it. And so what do we see? shall not taste of death till they have seen, past tense, meaning they will have seen something coming, which is the kingdom of God. And they will have seen it come before they won't taste of death. You see, what did I tell you earlier? This is the group, only Luke's group goes first, and nothing's going to be seen. The first thing they're going to see is the kingdom of God. They're going to the third heaven. The third heaven and paradise are connected. They're both part of the kingdom of God. They're both a taking. It's a taking, a taking, and a return. Okay? And what do we see? They will have seen it come. That means when the Lord's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals to, to destroy the enemies of Israel, when they'll turn and stop the fighting against themselves and come to fight against him, at the end of six days or years it's going to be seen coming and happening before those who won't taste of death just as i like i said in the beginning just like mark's discourse they're going to see it coming before the great multitude rapture happens and then what happens when we go to matthew well you see what's wild in matthew there is no verse. There's a reason the Spirit led these people to lay out the chapters and the verses the way they did. Look at Matthew's. The transfiguration story begins right away with the after six days. Where, how come there's no verses before it? You want to know why there's no verses before it? Remember what Matthew 24 said? Immediately. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. 
So why does immediately matter? Because there's nothing that's going to be seen prior to him coming, bang, feet down on the Mount of Olives. But if you go to chapter 16 and you go to the end of it, listen to what it says. Verse 28, verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You see the differences? Three comings of the Lord, one for his 40 days of the Son of Man starting on the eighth day, and then he's coming after six days as years, and after six days as years, and the conversations of both are different. There are three comings of the Lord, and this after six days in Matthew is the after six years of trumpet judgments, and he's returning on at the beginning feet down on the Mount of Olives immediately after the sixth year. There's a reason for that too. He rises up and then boom, will return immediately after feet down on the Mount of Olives as the king, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Three comings of the Lord. Let me show you another spot. How about Revelation chapter 6? We've shown you that chapter Revelation chapter 6, the white horse rider, is the Son of Man. For those of you that don't know and you say, no, no, it's the Antichrist. No, it's only because you've been told by others who didn't yet have the understanding that it's the Antichrist. It is not the Antichrist. It is the Son of Man. And you can come right over here and watch this teaching for yourself, the white horse rider. You will see and understand for yourself. But like I always say, don't start there. Go back and watch the intro series to understand these differences. And then you're watching this, and then come and watch this, and you will understand that the white horse rider is the son of man. He was given a crown because he had just gotten married, and his mother gave him the crown. It's, it's wild. It's awesome to understand. Well, which one is this? This is his coming. For 40 days as the white horse rider a lot of people say well if if he's the one opening the seals how could he be the one coming as the white horse rider well the answer is found in verse 1 he doesn't open all the seals at the exact same time it's not one year one seal second year second seal third year third seal that's not how it plays out he opens one and then he'll open the second and third and the fourth and one will stop and another one will continue and it'll overlap with another and then it'll stop and then the next one, okay? It's not one and then another and then another. But the first one absolutely is. He tells us right here. And I saw the lamb open one of the seals. The first one that he opened, he then went out as the white horse rider and you will see that for yourself. This is the Luke discourse. When, when they see him coming in a cloud, who are the ones that see him coming in a single cloud? It's the remnant workers who were told to be ready for him when he returns from the wedding, which is seven days long, so he's coming back on the eighth day. Where did we see the eighth day? That he would be coming back as when a group of people who were taken, who wouldn't see anything except the next thing they would see, never having tasted of death, would be the kingdom of God. And then what does he do? He comes back on the eighth day. And he's going to fulfill the 40 days as the Son of Man is the white horse rider. Well, what about Mark's? Well, we come to the end of the sixth seal. We see the stars of heaven falling. We see them hiding and freaking out. Rich, poor, everybody is freaking out and hiding in the rocks of the mountains and everywhere. And it says, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Do you know why? Because, remember Mark's, Mark's uh, um, uh, transfiguration, uh, yeah, transfiguration story? A group saw him coming. They will have seen the kingdom of God come. This is him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. They're going to, they will have seen him come with what? 
the kingdom of God. This is when he comes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he comes with paradise. He's coming with the mountain carved without hand. And the world is going to panic. Could you imagine? We've done teachings on what this could look like now. It is a mind-blowing, mind-melt revelation to understand. People are looking at this coming. Mark 9 said they will have seen it come before they're going to not taste of death for those who are still alive. It's wild. This is Mark's discourse, him coming at the end of the six year of seals, when he's coming in the clouds, plural. So the whole world, they're not going to notice and say, oh, that's him. But they're going to see this coming. It's going to be so massive, so powerful. He's coming with the kingdom of God, with heavenly Mount Zion, with paradise. What? Well, what about Matthews? Matthews is found in Revelation chapter, 12, uh, chapter 11. And look at what we see that comes first. The two witnesses die. Their bodies are laying there for three and a half days. Okay? And after three and a half days, the Spirit of God enters them. And in the same hour, there's a great earthquake. So they stood up. And in the same hour in which they stood up, and were taken up into heaven. There's a great earthquake. The second woe is passed. And then what? The seventh angel begins to sound. The seventh angel begins to sound. Remember what Matthew said? Matthew said immediately after these things, then they're going to see him coming as lightning from one end unto the other. Immediately after. And then in, in Matthew's transfiguration story, there was nothing above chapter 17 from boom, it's him coming right at that point. Well, we see this. If we go into Revelation chapter 10, we see what happens at the sound of the seventh trumpet. In verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. Why is the mystery of God finished? Because now the Lord is returning to feet down on the Mount of Olives, and the whole world will see him as lightning, like Matthew's discourse, only in Matthew's discourse of the discourses, when he will be seen as lightning from one end unto the other. And look what happens when that seventh angel is sounding. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Ta-da! Three comings of the Lord. And that's what I, that's just three places I've shown you. Three places we could do it. I, I could spend the next six hours just showing you the exact same thing in all of the different prophetic typologies within the synoptic gospels. It's everywhere. And it is awesome. Well, you're going to remember that there's also another place. There's another place. And it's something we call Luke in order. And for those of you who haven't seen that before, it's a wild revelation, but you don't start there because you need to see with the end time eyes first. And so let me show you where it is so you can see it for yourselves right here. The mystery of Luke knowing all things in order right here. Okay. And why is this a big deal? Well, you have to remember, first of all, only the Luke group is the group that goes before anything happens remember luke 21 36 it's the only group where the discourse says there's the there's one of the escapes okay there's the pre-trib which we also call the escape it happens before anything else then the son of man comes after the wedding and then as i said earlier the son of man comes at the end of the sixth year they all see it they're in a panic they will have seen the kingdom of god come and then a few months later, that's when the great multitude will be taken in, will be raptured, the great multitude mid-trib rapture. And then, of course, the Matthew one, it'll be immediately after that sixth year of trumpet judgments, which is the end of a total of the 13 years out of the 14. And the whole world will see him as lightning from one end unto the other. And the mystery will be over because now the whole world will see him coming. Okay. And then. Those who were taken into a place protected will come back after that final year. 
this is the only group, the pre-trib group is the only group that is shown in the discourse, and it's the only group that goes before any coming of the Lord. <clears throat> now, there's a reason I mention that. Because in the story of Luke in order, it's about chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4. Within those four chapters, you have the pre-trib connected to John the Baptist, who is what? John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost from being in the womb, from conception. He is the one in the spirit of Elijah and the remnant group that the Father chooses from among the pre-trib before they're taken they're going to be told that they're going to remain to stay to serve the Lord. They're being prepared. And when this time comes, the Lord will choose them. They will know just, I don't know how far in advance, but they'll know moments before at least the pre-trib happens. And they're going to remain till the Lord returns on that eighth day from the wedding. This group are the ones who are the John the Baptist or the Elijah company. Everybody going though pre-trib, including the workers who are chosen from among them to remain, they are all part of the spirit-filled in Christ group. And what do we know about the story of John? Well, as we've shared, either John the Baptist is born at uh, third month, 15th day, and Jesus is born in the, the ninth month, 15th day, right? Or vice versa. Well, we now know John is born in the third month, 15th day, and Jesus is born at around Christmas time, what was third month, 15th day, or what now is the ninth month, 15th day, which is the month we're in in Hanukkah. Now, which means in, let me go back, let me go to 2024 just to show everybody. Which means Jesus, according to the Hebrew calendar, this is Jesus's birth. Okay, we've talked before, maybe it's supposed to be connected to the solstices and the equinoxes and all that, and the world just puts it here, okay? But according to the count and scripture, it would be the equivalent of third month, 15th day from Tishri, okay? As it was in the beginning. And that means John was born the third month, 15th day, which is Savan, or in 2025, it would be June 11th. We know, of course, and we'll touch on again, that in, uh, in uh, John chapter 4, Jesus says four months early, before what? Before the wheat harvest is ready. Okay, the time of the wheat harvest starts here. And he said four months early. And of course, we know that brings us to here. But is this the pre-trib? No, this is the pre-trib. Depending what side of the world you're on, this is the pre-trib. And this is his coming back on the eighth day. When he comes back on this eighth day, <coughs> who is it connected to? It's going to be connected to the time of the almond blossom, which is connected, as we'll see, to the priestly line. And who was John the Baptist? Well, John the Baptist was the priestly line, was he not? John the Baptist, his parents were the priestly line. And that's why John the Baptist was the one who baptized Jesus, right? And we know that in the end of days, there's the Elijah company, which are those who are in the spirit of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is connected. Remember, John the Baptist bore witness, right? In, um, in John chapter 1, he wasn't the light, but he was the one to bear witness of that light. The only one who could bear witness, the only people who could bear witness of the light are the ones who are of the spirit. The ones who are of the Spirit, everybody going pre-trib, and the remnant who remain are of the Spirit in Christ, like in the beginning of creation, Genesis 1-1. That's the only way you could be witness when Christ was made light by the Father in Genesis 1-3. How could you be witness if you weren't there? You had to be Spirit. Okay? Wait until you see the connection that as I was in a conversation earlier today with our brother Mark and he was talking about Genesis 1 1 in relation to water. Water is our theme tonight. It's it, it was awesome. So it's another piece we're going to incorporate here later as well. So what do we really find out about John? Well, in chapter one of Luke, we find the story of John. <clears throat> excuse me. 
the story of John, but then what is it really about? His birth. It's a story of the birth of John the Baptist. And then what does it talk about? Lo and behold, <laughs> the eighth day. Do you see a theme going on here? Do you see a theme? Let me ask you something. Is Jesus in the picture in John chapter 1? Nope. Nope. Was Jesus in the picture in Luke's discourse before the pre-trib? Nope. You see? This is the story of the pre-trib in the typology of John, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, going pre-trib. But John more specifically is the picture of those who are chosen to remain. And when he returns on the eighth day. So what do we get in the story of John the Baptist? We get the story of those who are in Christ's spirit filled, who are the picture of those taken at his birth, pre-trip. And then we've got the eighth day for the remnant of those who weren't taken but chosen to remain, who will serve as the John the Baptists when the Lord returns on the eighth day. What do you mean? There's no Lord returning on the eighth day here. No, but you can see, oh my goodness, this gets so crazy. Um, our, our brother, uh, another great share that I, that I have on, on the back burner that is part of the upcoming teachings I want to do, and I still have to spend more time in it, is uh, our brother Herman, and we had another sister Ann years ago who shared it with me, but I just wasn't at the ready mindset. There's just, there's always so much to study, and sometimes I forget. It goes on the back burner a little bit, and I forget. Well, you'll remember this when, uh, when we get to Isaiah, and we do a teaching on um, three chapters of Isaiah that are connected to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's wild. And when you see the one of Luke, it says to perform the mercy promise to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant this this group of servants uh i'm not going to get into it now it's awesome okay it's another exciting thing so we see this and then it says blessed be the lord god of israel he hath visited listen to this and redeemed his people sound familiar it should sound familiar right Luke chapter 21, at the coming of the Son of Man, for your redemption draweth nigh. A group of people being redeemed in this same connection to John chapter, to Luke chapter 1, connected to John, this remnant group, a group gone before Christ comes because they're going to be at the wedding with them, the pre-trib Gentile bride wedding, before he returns on the eighth day to begin his 40 days. Now, I'm not going to go jump ahead yet, but I want to show this point. Birth, pre-trib is gone. Remnant group remains until the Lord comes on the eighth day. Well, this is the last age or time frame of John that we get here. And then what happens? You go to Luke chapter 2, and who shows up next? Jesus' birth. And Jesus' birth begins the 40 days. Well, if you just simply track it in Luke in order, it's the Lord connect, prophetically coming on the eighth day. This was the last mention of John's age in chapter 1. And wh what, did I just, what did we just show in the other chapters? I mean, you saw that in Luke's transfiguration story. He even said the eight, about an eight days later. But when we went to Mark and went to Matthews, it was after six days after six days. You see how wild that is? <laughs> it's everywhere. After seven days is the eighth day, and it's a seven-day wedding. Well, now watch, watch what comes next. <clears throat> this is going to get pretty wild, okay? This is going to get really wild. So let's go to Genesis chapter 30. Watch this. Genesis chapter 30. <clears throat> Let me go to Esword. For those that don't have Esword, I, it's free or maybe a few dollars a year. I have no stake in it whatsoever. But 
it's um you get you can have all the different bible versions i only use kjv this is kjv plus everybody should just use kjv this is kjv plus and look you get all the word definitions and this is very important to have as i'm about to show you watch this so i don't know if i went too big okay watch what happens we're gonna go to look at one of the 12 tribes we're gonna look at oh let me make sure i've got the right guy we're gonna look at zebulun okay why on earth are we looking at zebulun <coughs> well hold on to your horses guys because this is what our brother orlando had shared in the forum and it was awesome okay in genesis 30 verse 20 and leah said god hath endued me with a good dowry okay with a good gift now will my husband dwell with me now will my husband dwell with me okay what does it mean to enclose that is to reside dwell with it's used one time one time to dwell now her husband will dwell with her who does leah represent brothers and sisters i think leah represents the pre-trib bride doesn't she and here she is saying now my husband will dwell with me <clears throat> the gentile the older before the younger right the 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 beginning the first before the the oldest before the youngest and here's leah saying now my husband will dwell with me will reside with me and zebulun's name means habitation okay to enclose look it's the root word of the definition of what she was saying habitation now my husband will dwell with me are you ready for this let's go another step further in genesis chapter 7 verse 1 and the lord said unto noah come thou and all thy house into the ark for thee have i seen righteous who are called the righteous brothers and sisters those who are in Christ, spirit-filled. And look at what it says. For yet seven days, I will cause it to rain upon the earth. After seven days, what happens? The waters of the flood were upon the earth. You're going to want to remember that. The waters during the 40 days, waters on the earth. Waters, maybe that'll be part of the title tonight three it, it's all in threes and waters on the earth right water it starts the 40 days is water and it's the son of man so what comes after seven days the eighth day so what starts the eighth day the 40 days of the son of man the flood of water on the earth it's everywhere it's all over the place how many what's that three or four times now eight eight after seven which is the eighth well let me show you this in relation to zebulun okay the story with zebulun is pretty wild <clears throat> watch what happens in this chart here which again i told you guys before i didn't make this chart this chart is from scripture we have judah that leads so the only thing is is they've lined them up like this like i told you before but it should be judah and then the next two tribes reuben and then the next two tribes ephraim the next two tribes dan and the next two tribes behind them and these are the priests okay it's the tabernacle family <clears throat> excuse me ta the tabernacle families of levi camped about okay so these are all through the, the, the priestly line of the Levites. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're overseeing different portions uh, being spread out within the tribes. And of course, they all belong to the Father. 
Now, Ruben is here, Ephraim is here, Dan and Judah. They're the four main ones called the Four Corners. Well, you'll remember something <clears throat> that we shared not long ago where we said the pre-trib begins on the east, and then this is the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days, right? Remember the four faces around the throne? Then it's the ox when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, just as we've been talking about. This is mid-trumpets when they fly away on the wings of an eagle and the serpent is cast down. And this is when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. This one isn't connected to one of the comings of Christ. There's only three. We'll share on this a little bit more uh, coming up. This is one of them. This is the Luke one for 40 days. This is the Mark one at the end of six days, six years, at the end of the six year of seals that we saw. And this is his return, feet down, <clears throat> excuse me, on the Mount of Olives at the beginning of that 14th year. Now, you want to check something out? Look at Zebulun here. This gets wild. I'm going to do a full teaching on all of this in the near future it's one of my it's another one of the teachings i've got planned but this is wild and this is what our brother orlando caught on it okay remember that zebulun his name means now my husband will dwell with me but there's more to his name okay there's more to his name and I might be showing it somewhere else later, but I've got to show this to you. Watch this. In Numbers chapter 29. Remember I said my my mind kind of my mind went off. I was thinking about something as I was talking about something else that I said was going to be really wild when we got there. Watch this. <clears throat> Reuben is the firstborn son. Okay? Reuben is the firstborn son. We know his name means see a son, okay? Which is a man. She, he's called a son. <clears throat> We're going to see looked upon my affliction. We're going to talk about all of that. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you remember in the recent teaching, in the last teaching, we know that Reuben is the man of water and he is connected to Aquarius. Okay, Reuben is the first one here. But guess what? Want to know what's wild about it? What happens before the Son of Man comes as the Reuben man of water? Okay, as the man face, as the, the seven beasts around the throne. Okay, the one that represents man, the Son of Man coming for 40 days. What happens first, guys? Do you remember what happens first? Oh, yeah, the pre-trib as Leah, right? The pre-trib, which is Leah, the older before the younger, that we've taught about for years before Reuben, right? Reuben is the beginning of the 40 days. Watch this. What do we see first? <laughs> what do we see in Genesis 29, verse 27? Chapter 29, verse 27. Laban tells... Jacob to fulfill his wedding week, which is Shabua, which means feast of weeks, which is John's birthday, as we've been sharing, which is John's birthday right here, the 15th day of the third month. But remember, Jesus said <clears throat> four months earlier, right? Well, watch this. Oh, it's so wild. Watch this. The wedding week happens, right? The week happens first. The wedding happens first. What happens after Jesus fulfills the seven-day wedding week? What happens next, brothers and sisters? It's the Son of Man coming on the eighth day, right? Who is, in the picture of the tribes, who is the Son of Man represented as? Reuben. Represented as Reuben. There's the wedding week. And look at the story that comes next. 
and Leah conceived and bare a son and called his name Reuben. Who's Reuben, guys? He's the firstborn, right? He's the firstborn. And look at the story. It's the wedding week. And then it goes into the story of the birth of the firstborn son, which is Reuben. How wild is that? That was a little side note I had to share with you guys. But this is where we're going with it, okay? Watch this. Watch this. The wedding happens first, <clears throat> and we explained that it's connected to the east, okay? It's connected to this portion that's, yes, Judah is the head, but there's still two other groups. Well, look at Zebulun. Zebulun, it has as a ship. <clears throat> but we know more so, it's not just a ship. But it's also, now my husband will dwell with me. And what do we know about a ship, brothers and sisters? What do we know about a ship? Genesis 7.1 and the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou in all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Remember prophetically when you read this generation, it's talking about the final generation. Wait, wait. So those who are righteous, going pre-trib, going there before, right? The seven days. They're going in at the start of the seven days. And what are they going into? They're going into the ark, which is a ship. Pre-trib, going into an ark, which is a ship, which we've explained the pre-trib is connected to going here. And the name means now my husband will dwell with me? Do you get it? This is the pre-trib. This is the bride connection that we've been talking about on the east side connected to Zebulun, and it's the pre-trib bride saying, now my husband will dwell with me. And the prophetic picture we've known is the story of the ark. What else happens? What happens as soon as they're taken to go dwell now with their husband? There's an attack on Israel, a sword at the city gate. It's the first attack, right, in northern Israel. It lasts for seven days while the wedding is going on. Then the son of man, who is the man of water, which is, which is Aquarius, and pouring out the bucket of water, which we're going to get into in more detail, is here for 40 days. And once he is gone and the 40 days are over, then what happens? They, Jerusalem gets compassed about by the leader of a troop, and Jerusalem is destroyed. This is the story of the pre-trib bride being taken, the seven-day war that's taking place in the Middle East during the wedding, with the bride, the husband now being with her bride, then him coming on the eighth day, and then the attack at the end when the 40 days of the Son of Man is gone, the compassing about, and then the attack on Jerusalem. In the details of their names. You want to see what's really cool? What do we know happens at the end of tribulation? Do we not know that there's two weddings, brothers and sisters? Are we not aware that there are two weddings? There is a pre-trib Gentile bride wedding. Leah, now my husband will dwell with me, right? Well, then you've got the 50 days playing out. You've got the six years of seals. You've got the first half of trumpets or the trumpet judgments until what? Until the coming of the Lord, who is the one coming on, remember, the ass and the colt, which is only found in Matthew which is described in Genesis 49 for the, the story for, for Judah. And then here he is, the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
He is returned. He is seen from one end unto the other. Do you know what happens in the final year? It's the story of Noah, isn't it? <laughs> it's the story of Noah. Right? It starts with the story of Noah in the big picture that then connects the 40 days of the Son of Man to water because of the flood during 40 days, which is connected to Aquarius, which is Reuben's month. And in the very end, in Matthew chapter 24, we know that the wedding takes place and then he prepares the place for one year and that one year represents what brothers and sisters the days of noah the days of noah the days of noah the final 14th year is the one year and 10 days as noah and what will they say at the end now my husband will dwell with me what do you see how mind-blowing that is? Wait until I go into the detail of this in another teaching. <clears throat> it's astronomical. When I was going through this the other day, I told you guys I wasn't really too certain about a ship. I had a couple points here and there, but I wasn't too certain. And then Orlando posts about this, and I was like, what? There's a duel in this. It's the pre-trib bride, and it's the end of the 14 years post-trib. And what do we know it starts at? It starts off with the story is Noah in Luke 17, and it ends the 14th year in Matthew 24, the story of Noah, which is the full representation of the final year. Unbelievable. And look, Zebulun's not over here, and Issachar is over here. Right? The way they would play out, that means Issachar's probably here, and Zebulun's over here. Because <clears throat> it would be the, the Son of Man... Uh, uh, the Messiah, Ben, uh, uh, Ben Judah, right? Or if you want to know Messiah, Ben Judah, when, when the lion of the tribe of Judah returns feet down, he's going to destroy all the enemies in that final year. Right? And there's a, there's a group protected for that final year. And then what happens? It's Zebulun again. He will now dwell with his bride and there's that millennial reign. That's awesome. You know what this does? <clears throat> this yet again proves that the revelation of all of these parts and pieces that we have shown, that we have grown in understanding piece by piece by piece from revealing the seven churches and building on it with even greater detail to the, the tribes around the tabernacle in the wilderness with greater detail. Every single time there's a detail added fits exactly where it should be in the revelation of the end of days, which is the 50 days and 14 years every single time. It's wild. So awesome. Absolutely incredible. I love it. It's so exciting, guys. I hope you grasp that. I know those of you who have been around for a while, you'll grasp it, right? It's very exciting. So now let's go back. We saw that in Luke 1. <clears throat> it was related to, oh, I am, where's Luke 1? So we saw in Luke 1, it's the pre-trib going first, just like uh, uh, Genesis 7. 7a seven is just like, you know, 7 to the 8th day. The group going and a group being chosen to remain. <clears throat> in Luke chapter 2, we went from that being the 8th day and the eighth day begins the 40 days. The 40 days now, this is a picture of what? The 40 days of the birth of Christ is a picture of the Son of Man now in the prophetic, intertwined within it that we see, is a picture of the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days. Well, remember what happens. The, of the four beasts around the throne, the man is the one of the south, and Reuben is the one that he represents. <clears throat> and he's represented by it in his name, which is man and also water. This is the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days. But we know a mystery of it, right? We know that the big mystery 
isn't that he was coming exactly on his birthday. And this is a big deal to just bring up again. We've talked about it a hundred times, but I'm bringing it up again for those that might be newer who didn't see it before. Isaiah chapter 9 is the prophetic revelation of the above 50 days that are coming. Soon as the pre-trib bride is gone, the first attack comes in northern Israel, which will be Haifa and Tel Aviv, but which was the light affliction on Zebulun and Naphtali. And then what do we see? The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, which is just as John the Baptist, right? It's the same as as Luke uh, as John chapter one in the one oneers Genesis one 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 two the first creation it's the spirit creation which John is prophetically in this typology was a part of and so is everybody pre trib as well as that remnant group that are going to be here to serve the Lord they will bear witness of him coming as the light in the darkness. Okay, they will bear witness of that. I'm going to highlight this so you guys can remember this one that's coming. Okay, so they're going to be just like the John the Baptist. And then the Son of Man is coming as the light in the darkness. Well, not only do we see the connection here from John chapter 1, we also see it in Isaiah chapter 9. We see this first seven days, like that first group gone to the wedding. And the first attack, the light affliction, happens on Haifa and Tel Aviv. And then the people who walked in darkness will see a great light. And what's the connection? For unto us a child is born. Well, what's Luke chapter 2? The birth of Christ. For unto us a child is born. The only difference is it's not going to be at his birthday, which, would, which is already passed, I think. Where is it? All right? So if we go back into 2024... His birthday would be next Monday, okay? This would be Jesus' birthday, according to the Hebrew calendar count, would be officially right here. But, so you would think, man, this should have been the pre-trib, and then this is his return on the eighth day. With an exception, though. And we've known this now for a while. We've been teaching on this for a while. When Jesus fulfilled this, which is a picture of his 40 days, like Luke chapter 2 and all those other places, we then see, then Syria's coming, and those who are with Syria will devour with an open mouth, and that's when Jerusalem is compassed about and then destroyed, which is the greater affliction that then comes after. Okay, that's the end of the 50 days, or the start of the 14 years. But what we're looking at here is it says, for unto us a child is born. We go to Luke in order. We go to chapter 2. There's the 40 days of the Son of Man when the child is born unto them. But you'll remember in Matthew chapter 4, which is the fulfillment from the was into the is, it says, when Jesus fulfilled this, right, uh, to the border of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Okay? He fulfilled it in his lifetime, but there is an is-to-come fulfillment of it. But was it at his birthday when he fulfilled it? No. And how do we know it? Because it says, now when Jesus heard that John was in prison. John was not in prison at the time of Jesus' birth, and we know it from chapter 3. Everybody knows it because at the time of Jesus' birth, it says in Luke chapter 3, he began to be about 30 when he was baptized. And then John was still around. Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days. John was still around. He came out of the wilderness. John was still around baptizing with his people. It was about two months later. And what happened when we went two months from Jesus' birthday? We found out it was right here. This is the time connection. This is literally where all of this had already led us to right here as the coming of the Son of Man when he returns to begin his 40 days is connected to Tuba Shavat right here, connected to the time of the almond tree, which is connected to the watchman 
for those who are watching, right? Like the shape of an almond. That's what it's going to. So we see this in Luke chapter 2. The 40 days is a picture of the Son of Man's birth. We go to Isaiah 9. It is a picture of for unto us a child is born, just like here. But then we realized that the fulfillment in Matthew 4 told us that it wasn't exactly at his birthday, but it had to be a short period after at which time John was put into prison. That was the fulfillment that brought us in the summer count to the fifth month, ninth day, eighth to the ninth, and then the 15th, 16th of the ninth month, which is his return on the eighth day. Only to find out that there was a mirror reflection that began from the fall. And when we applied that same count, it brought us to right here. And in having brought us to right here, we came to find out <clears throat> this piece about Reuben. We already understood the ox for a long time. We taught that it's Messiah ben Joseph, right? Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben Ephraim, same thing. We already knew that this was mid-trumpets when they fly away on eagles' wings and Satan is cast down. We already knew this is the return of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives. But we also knew this was the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days. We just never had it connected to Reuben. Now, not only connect it, can we connect it to Reuben, we can play out the entire story and connect the timing of the priests from when Aaron was chosen it's awesome stuff guys <clears throat> you see so this is that now luke in order jesus isn't in chapter one just as the pre-trib jesus isn't there first he comes on the eighth day here he is john's eighth day and this is the coming of the son of man two months after his birthday when john in the typology is now put into prison and it's his birth. But remember, that was that was the typology from what played out from the was to the is. Okay? The was is from creation to Christ. The is is from Christ until the pre-trib. And the is to come is from pre-trib until the end. In the end of days, this isn't in, in Luke chapter 1, the birth of John. Well, that's not when John is being taken. Right? This isn't when Jesus is showing up at the end of the sixth year of seals. It's all about the parts in the beginning because the John group is going to remain until what? Until Luke chapter 3, which is the prophetic picture of the end of the sixth year of seals. And it says in Luke chapter 3, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And they said, uh, then said he to the multitude that came to be baptized, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. From the wrath to come, that sounds familiar too, doesn't it? The wrath of the Lamb comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. Exactly. It's a prophetic picture built into this, which is when you go watch the teaching, you will see that this in the, in the Luke in order, one, two, three, four, it's a prophetic picture of the end of the sixth year of seals whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his granier, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Okay? That's the great multitude rapture of the wheat harvest, the main harvest coming in. So again, why am I showing this? We're seeing the three portions of Christ like we were in the other pieces over here. Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 3, and watch what happens now when we get to Luke chapter 4. Satan's on the scene. Huh. Funny how that happens, right? Satan is cast down mid-trumpets. He's here till the end of the 13th year. He has two and a half years in the, in, in the final three and a half years of tribulation, the final three and a half of the seven years of trumpet judgments. He gets two and a half years. And this is the end of... When the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and look at how it starts. Forty days being tempted in the wilderness. What? 
40 days being tempted by the devil. <clears throat> and guess what happens if we go into Genesis and chapter 7 in the story of the ark. Look at what it says. Verse 11. In the second month, 17th day of the month, the waters of the great deep began, right? The 40 days and 40 nights started. Well, remember, there was this prophetic picture, which is the story of the beginning Luke one for 40 days of the Son of Man. And then there's another one at the end, which is the final year when Matthew 24 days of Noah will play out. And so it starts with the 40 days. And when it's over, <coughs> excuse me, and when it's over, it's the second month, 27th day. So it's one year and 10 days, which we know, and I talked a little bit at the beginning. We'll get into it in another teaching to show that the final year is one year and 10 days like Noah because it'll be the connection to the final Jubilee. And when you see this teaching that I will work on from this video of how to count the final Jubilee, it is going to all make sense and blow your mind, even though everything is beginning at Nissan for the 14 years, how did we count everything? We got there from a fall count because everything's a mirror reflection. Because there are two times of year, sowing and reaping, winter and summer. You see? Seed time <coughs> excuse me, and harvest time begins from a fall count to get us to a spring count, and then the spring count is the 14 years, but we got there from a count that started six months earlier in the fall. When you see this connected, all because of where this all began with the mirror reflection, when you see where this all will lead us to show us how to count and understand the Jubilee, had, I, had we seen this teaching months ago or years in advance, it would have never made any sense because we needed to get to this point that started with the mirror revelation. <clears throat> okay, so what are we seeing here? <clears throat> Excuse me. My, my throat was a little bit hoarse earlier today, so maybe that's what's going on. And I've got the heat going on beside me, maybe that too. So remember what we saw in Luke chapter 2, which is the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man? Connected to his birth, and what's it about? The 40 days. Right? The beginning of the 40 days and the above. And, and what do we know about it? We know that Luke 17 said his would be as the days of Noah, connected to the 40 days that, that is in the above portion. Now we get to the final year, and the final year is Matthew chapter 24, when the Lord has returned immediately after the tribulation of those days, and it would be as it was in the days of Noah, which is why you only find it in Matthew's discourse. It's the final year of tribulation. And you get to Luke chapter 4. And it starts with 40 days. You see, there's a 40 days for Luke 17, the days of Noah, which is in the above portion. And then the Matthew 24, which is the whole story that will play out in the year and 10 days, starts with the 40 days. It's, in, it's brilliantly connected. This, not because I'm brilliant. I certainly am not. It is the spirit that has led us in all of this over the years. And this is why we see that the devil, Satan, says all of this was given to him in a moment of time. Yeah. In, in the midpoint of trumpets, when he is the serpent, when he gets cast down. We're going to touch on this just briefly tonight, too. But we're going to still touch on this. <clears throat> it's, man, it's wild. So we see this point where now it's the final year. It's the, it's the days of Noah that will play out as the year in 10 days. And it begins with the 40 days. And Satan is here because he was given the authority for the last two and a half years of the final three and a half. He's given over and over a moment of time. We know the temple was rebuilt in the second, in the first half of trumpets. And that's why he's gone on the pinnacle of the temple. And then we know he ends up defeating him, right? He ends up defeating him. 
and they all glorified him, right? And everybody's celebrating. And then what do we read? Then was delivered the book of Isaiah. And when the book of Isaiah was delivered to him, he preached about what? The recovering of the sight to the blind, uh, of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. He's reading from Isaiah 61, declaring the Jubilee to preach unto them the acceptable year of the Lord. He's declaring the Jubilee after this one year event that takes place, having been tempted by Satan, defeats him. And now he's declaring the Jubilee. Well, what happens after that final year as Noah? On the 10th day, a year and 10 days, it's the sounding of the shofar on the Day of Atonement. This is Luke in order. And it's chapter 2, 3, and 4 that are his three comings. And those three comings, like in the other parts that we showed, are his coming as the Son of Man for 40 days, during water connected to man, which is Reuben, which is Aquarius, which has proven to us that the Son of Man is coming at the year, whatever year it might be, but I believe we, we've proven that it will be this year, and it's going to be in the month of Aquarius. When I say this year, I mean from a Nissan to Nissan count, it will be in the month of Aquarius. The Bible has said so. And we know when he comes at the end of seals, he is represented as the ox, the unicorn, the wild bull. And he is Ephraim, the Messiah ben Ephraim or Messiah ben Joseph. Same thing when we talk about it in the end of days. This is when he comes as the end of the, at the end of the sixth year of seals, which is what we saw at the end of the sixth uh, Revelation chapter six. This is first seal. This is the end of the sixth seal, the end of six years of seals. And this is when he returns feet down as the line of the tribe of Judah, as we said. But we also know there's the portion of the eagle and the serpent and all this stuff going on with Dan. That isn't one of his comings because when he comes for this, he is this until the end of the sixth year of trumpets before he then returns immediately as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, so now watch what happens. Now we've seen these three portions. We know there are three comings. In the teaching that we did, I don't remember if I shared, um, I don't think I shared this in the um, all, all great truths begin as blasphemies. I think I shared this in the, uh, in the live show. So now we're getting to this really awesome nitty gritty detail that proves scripturally that the son of man is coming at the time of the water bearer which is the man with the pitcher of water which is luke chapter 22 i believe it is or 23 22 when they're going to go find the man with the pitcher of water that meal that they're having with the man with the pitcher of water to go and prepare that meal is the banquet meal that the Lord is going to have with the remnant workers when he returns from the wedding on the eighth day. Okay? We talked about that, I think, in the previous one. So watch this. Visions such as those of Ezekiel and John describe figures with the heads of a man, lion, ox, and eagle, which just happen to match the four cornerstone constellations in Ezekiel 1.10 and Revelation 4.7. It is precisely these four figures which are the most easily matched with the four principal sons of Israel, because each is mentioned in the blessings. Reuben is compared to a man and to water. Judah is compared to a lion, Dan to a serpent, counterpart of the eagle, and Joseph's two sons as the horns of the wild ox. Uh, those link to the constellations of the water bearer, hello, to the water bearer, Exactly the man with the pitcher of water, which is Aquarius, to the lion, to scorpion. Remember, it's a scorpion, and if you remain on your belly, you, you're like a serpent, right? You're with the serpent. If you overcome, you're an eagle. And the bull, respectively, from Genesis 49 and Deuteronomy 33. 
Those four sons are each also assigned to four directions in Numbers chapter 2, 10, 18, and 25. Let's go look at Numbers chapter 2. We'll just do this briefly. <clears throat> it's to make another crystal clear point of the three portions that are Christ's, but not the fourth one, right? Not one of them. So we see on the east side is the camp of Judah. So he's, he's the one that heads the camp to the east, which we showed is the line of the tribe of Judah, and the other two line up behind him. Then we have on the south side is Reuben. You see, we're not guessing these things. This, this isn't, this isn't a, a guesstimate. This is what the scriptures have revealed. Okay, It's right there in writing. To the south side, Reuben is the head, and then you've got the other two tribes <clears throat> that are behind him. Then you have the, the tabernacle and the Levites. And remember, the Levites, the priestly line, they all belong to the Father. So that's pretty wild too, right? And then it says, on the west side is Ephraim. And then the other two behind him. Well, Ephraim is the ox, right? And then we see the standard of the camp of Dan. I don't know why it's not keeping these colors, but to the camp of Dan is the north side. And I shared in the in the live show, look at, did you notice something? Watch this. East side, Judah. South side, Reuben. West side, Ephraim. Dan, north side. You see how that switched up? The three that are connected to the Lord's coming, the three comings of the Lord in the end of days are described as the sides first and then the tribe. Yet for some reason, when it comes to Dan's, it mentions Dan first and then mentions the side that belongs to him. Right? What would be the reason for that? Why wasn't it all the same? Well, we can prove what that meaning is. There's a hidden purpose in it. Everything in Scripture is written the way it is for a reason. And the Spirit did lead those who separated the chapters and verses within Scripture. We've proven that here for years, and we've talked about it a number of times as well. Okay? There's a reason why Dan, before the side he's on, is mentioned. And it's because this one isn't connected to Christ of one of his three comings. Okay? So, when we look at it in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, like here's one that, uh, that people might want to look at. Let's see if we can bring it up uh, big enough, see if it'll show it. I hate these cookies. I reject all those things. So, yeah, it's not all that big anyways. So, let me show it to you here again, okay? So, we could see it right here, and this is what I was just discussing. Son of man, son of man, son of man. These are the three, or the Lord, okay? These are the three comings of the Lord, and Dan isn't, okay? Dan isn't. Something else is going on with Dan, and we're going to touch a little bit on that, but not go too, too far into it. Now, what did we talk about in the last teaching of death? was from this right here and again <clears throat> i can't remember if it was in the last teaching or if it was in the live show that we did in the last one but this was a breakdown of the constellations and their connections specifically this one to reuben see a man unstable as water he's the only one called or see a son okay a man a son is born unto them and unstable as water connected to water we see also it's Deliverer. We see it's the month of Shavat, which is the 11th month. So just as we were looking for the 5th month, when you count from Nisan, the 11th month from Nisan is the 5th month from Tishri, which is, again, that mere reflection. We're still, if we're counting from Tishri, we're still in the 5th month right here. If we're counting from Nisan, it's the 11th month. But in either case, what is it? Shavat is the man with the pitcher of water. He's Reuben. Okay? It's Reuben, and it's also connected to a rod. 
for connection. It's connected to heavy rains, surrounding and judgment, all of these things that we've talked about in connection to this time. Well, we're going to see something else here when it comes to this connection with a rod as well. In Numbers chapter 17, remember when God was choosing of the children of Israel? Right? Moses wanted that help, and his brother was the one that was going to help him. And so these guys, these heads of these tribes, they're all given a rod. And what happens? And it came to pass in uh, Numbers 17, verse 8. Let me show you why this is also wild. Watch this. Uh, Remember this? The seven churches, which we've also broken down and revealed for the end of days. It starts with Exodus, which is the espousals that we've talked about. And then what does it go into? It's, it has a connection to the book of Numbers, Numbers, and Numbers. Well, who's this group? Smyrna. Smyrna is the workers. Smyrna is when the Lord returns on the eighth day is the Smyrna group. That remnant group that we keep talking about. From among the bride, this is the group when the Lord is going to return and meet with them. And it's also connected to the book of Numbers in the prophetic. So this is the was of the Old Testament in a prophetic typology of the seven churches. This is the is since Christ in the seven churches. And this of the end of days, the is to come, the end of days, seven churches revealed in the was and in the is that played out over like 2,500 years, 2,000 years. In the end will play out in 50 days and 14 years. That's why the end of days is going to be crazy. That's why when people say, oh, the end of days have already started, they don't know what they're talking about. They haven't really understood what Scripture says that the end of days is going to be like. Okay? But look at this. It's connected to numbers. Its number starts with Smyrna. Why is this a big deal? Because it's connected to Aaron. When Aaron is chosen as a priest, look at what happens. In Numbers... Chapter 17, verse 8. And it came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. And yielded almonds. Who, who was Aaron? Aaron was the priestly line, right? The ones chosen for the father that belong to the father. They have no land amongst it because they're chosen of the father. They're the Levi and the, of the priestly line all the way around. A rod of almond? A budding almond? When is the son of man supposed to be coming back on the eighth day? Connected to? The new year of trees, which we have shown many times, is the direct correlation. It's the literal connection to the almond trees blossoming. The rod of almond branch blossoming buds for the almond tree. And it's the connection to the coming of the Son of Man to begin his 40 days. And who does he meet with first? He's meeting with the Smyrna group. Connected to numbers. Connected to the priestly line who will remain to serve the Lord, be with them for 40 days, and then serve them till the end of seals. Who are who? They're the ones directly connected to John the Baptist, who was born of the priestly line. You see how that works? And what happened with Aaron? The almond branch blossomed. On the same date that this all equaled? You think that's by chance? I don't. In fact, we know it's not. Well, now watch this. Let me show you some more connections to Reuben. We know Reuben's name. Okay, let's go into Genesis 49. We know that this connection is in the Last days. 
It's a prophetic. These blessings are prophetically spoken over these brothers. Okay, over the tribes. And Reuben, who is, see, a son, right? The firstborn, for unto us a son is born. The 40 days of the Son of Man, who is connected to the south, which is the man face of the four beasts. What is he called? The firstborn. The firstborn. The eldest son. The firstborn. The elder son. Uh, does that does that sound familiar to some of you guys? Who are the first ones to go? Who are the ones connected to the pre-trib and in the equivalent being the remnant who are staying? They're the firstborn. Just like the Leah connection. The older before the younger. We know that they're the firstborn. And then what does he say about them? Thou art my firstborn, my might, and, listen to this, the beginning <clears throat> of my strength. The excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. He's calling them his firstborn and the beginning. What? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's exactly the portion connected to those who are the beginning. Well, let me give you a little bit more detail. This is the one here where I was saying the week, right? Fulfill her week. And then you've got Reuben, right? Reuben comes next. And what do we get? We have, of course, the name Reuben, which we just covered. And what does she say when she has Reuben? She goes on to say after um, uh, um, what she had said in the other piece, what we were talking about, uh, that my husband... Oh, no, no, that was um, uh, that was the sixth one, uh, uh, Zebulun. So now, here she is, the firstborn, Reuben, connected to after the wedding week. <clears throat> and it says, the name of Reuben, and it says, For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. So not only is his name uh, um, counted as affliction and being a man and water being connected to him, but he's also called firstborn and the beginning. Firstborn, we know Christ is the firstborn, right? Christ is the firstborn, and we know that Christ as the firstborn is the one coming as Reuben the man as the son of man connected to his birth being the first born well we know many connections to this as well don't we so we saw beginning first born affliction let's go see what we can find from this okay the name of his main uh, the name the word for affliction there is called affliction and also poverty so it's affliction, poverty, beginning. You want to see where this takes us? <clears throat> Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Remember, all of this is connected to the 40 days of the Son of Man with Reuben. And is connected to the priestly line at the time of the budding of the almond branch, which is the John the Baptist group remnant group. Let's see what it says about Smyrna. And unto... The angel of the church of Smyrna write these things which saith the first, <laughs> which saith what? The first. Who is the first and the last? Who's the first and the last, brothers and sisters? Christ is the first and last, right? He's also what? The beginning. Huh. The beginning. The first and the last, the beginning. Check. There's one. But do you know what else this is saying? Who, who else is the first? Those who are in Christ's spirit filled, right? They went first. And the remnant from among them, that the, the John Elijah company, they are also the first. And Christ is also what? The last. Who else is the last, brothers and sisters? The remnant group. This remnant group will be the ones putting their necks on the line and they're going to be resurrected to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. They are also the first and the last. 
Remember they're co-heirs with Christ. Hello. Look what it goes on to say next, which was dead and is alive. So Christ is the first and the last. He was dead and is alive. And this remnant group who will be with the Lord, we are told in Scripture, are the first and the last. And they will die and they will be the ones take place, take part in the first resurrection and will rule and reign with them, sitting in his throne with him as he sits in his father's with his. Why? How can this be a group of people in the end of days as well as Christ? Because we're told they are co-heirs with him. They are, like we've been saying the whole time, they are little lambs. Right? They are the lambs. Christ is the lamb. These guys are little lambs. Christ is the rock. We're little rocks. Christ is the light. We'll be little lights. What else does it say about them? So not only the first or the beginning, but it says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. I know thy works, thy tribulation and poverty. So you've got tribulation, which is what? Tribulation, which is the persecution, which is the afflicted or affliction. So what do we got? Affliction, beginning, and poverty. What, what did it say about what he was called? It said that he was affliction, poverty, See, affliction and poverty, and the other one said was also the, in, Gen in Genesis, was the firstborn, the beginning. Come on. How much more clear does it have to be? Reuben is 100% unequivocally the representation of the timing of the Son of Man for the remnant workers who will serve him and be with him, who are the little lambs, the little rocks, at the timing of Reuben, which is Aquarius, the time of water and man, when the Son of Man comes for the 40 days of water. This isn't maybe, this isn't kind of, this, it, it's all here. All I'm doing is reading the words. I'm reading the words and showing you their definitions and literally how they're connected to this exact same group we've been talking about the whole time. Come on, man, this is so incredible. Now, watch what happens. This is the moment that I shared in lesser detail, and I know some people still need more time to absorb it. They need to see it in more detail, which was the purpose of leading through all of this to show the three portions of Christ's coming. Reuben, Ephraim, Judah. Three times. Everything is in threes. This was the moment when I just lost it. And I shared it in the live show. I'm going to share it again to connect it with all of these details. Because as I read this a week or so ago, it continued to say, after numbers, for those four constellations are evenly placed around the circle are the four points uh, of a compass, even non-Israelite prophets such as Balaam have used the same figures to represent the tribes in Numbers chapter 24, 7 through 9. And I said, what? What's Numbers chapter 24, 7 through 9 all about? And you guys will remember, I've shared on Numbers 24 before. And when I shared on it, it was in relation to, to the seven churches at the time of Constantine or Pergamum, which is the time when the beast will get his power to continue for 42 months with the false prophet there. Well, how did I prove it to you? 
<clears throat> anybody that wants to watch it and and follow it and see it in detail, you can come to this teaching right here. Right here. The Complete Seven Churches Revelation. Oh, man. Another mind blower. Absolutely incredible. That's why these teachings are longer. They're for people that want to study. They're, they're thirsty. Again, water. <laughs> they're thirsty. We're digging to understand these things. This will blow your mind as you understand some of these other pieces, as you understand that intro series. Okay? So what ended up happening, you go to the seven churches, and look what happens when you get to Pergamum. You get to Pergamum, and all of a sudden, you get the, conver the conversation of Balaam and Balak. Balaam and Balak. <clears throat> right there at the time that's prophetically understood for the coming of the beast, which is the Antichrist, and the false prophet, when he gets his power to continue for 42 months, we've shown how this is even connected to Mark's discourse in how the first portion has no beast, no false prophet, and then after the abomination, you have the conversation of the beast and the false prophet. Okay? The Antichrist and false prophet. Now, when, we, when I went and taught, on Numbers chapter 24, um, back, you know, back at that time with the seven churches, I was blinded. I believe the Spirit purposely blinded me. Because I read this as I was studying it for the seven churches. Whoops. <clears throat> from chapter 7, uh, sorry, chapter 24, Numbers 24, 7 through 10. I read it. And I just read right through it. And it never even dawned on me. I never paused. I never considered it. I had no clue. Because five to six months ago, we weren't yet ready because we hadn't yet understood it's a mirror. We hadn't yet understood. We were looking at that August time frame. So what did we come to see? Why was it so much more special this time? Why did it matter now that I was suddenly led to go to Numbers chapter 24 to see this conversation of the, of the tribes around the, wild, uh, uh, around the tabernacle in the wilderness with these head tribes being discussed? <clears throat> Why was that a big deal? Well, you're about to see what I saw. And when I read it this time, I almost fell out of my chair. I was so excited. I was telling my wife, we got it. It's done. This is it. I said some other things too, not bad, but some other things that I'm going to keep private. And I, I believe it's a done deal. It's a done deal because now these things have been revealed. At this time, why couldn't the Lord have led us? Why couldn't the Spirit have led us in this years earlier? And we could have just been tracking it and always watching to this over the last several years that we were trying to understand the end of 70 years. Why was it always the other portions? I believe because it was purposed, literally blinded to it until the time was right. That's my belief. Listen to what happens. In Numbers chapter 24, <clears throat> starting in, we'll start in, uh, well, we'll start in verse 1. Because what happens is Balak told Balaam to speak against his enemies, the Israelites. And he was going to speak and he was going to go as other times to get enchantments and set his face to the wilderness. But the Lord God caught him. And had him speak these blessings over the Israelites. It says in verse 2. And Balaam, who is the false prophet, right? He's the, the false prophet, like a picture of the false prophet at the end of days. And it says, and Balaam lifted up his eyes. And he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to the tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. Verse 4. He hath said, 
which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. This, <laughs> brothers and sisters, is an open vision. All right. He goes on to say, verse five, how goodly are the tents, are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel, as the valleys are they spread forth as gardens by the river's side, as the trees of line alloys which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. Are you ready for this? Pay attention. Remember everything I was just telling you about, about Reuben, about Ephraim, and about Judah, that we are told in Scripture. Remember, Luke, Mark, Matthew, three comings of the Lord connected to the south, the west, and the east, connected to the man with the pail of water, connected to the ox, and connected to the lion. These are the three comings of the Lord. And listen to what the Lord God Almighty had the false prophets speak over Israel. Verse 7, Numbers 24. He shall pour the water of his buckets on his seed, shall many, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, which means flame, and his kingdom shall be exalted. What? What? He shall pour the water out of his buckets? That's Reuben, brothers and sisters. That's Reuben. That's exactly what he's talking about here. They are the compass directions. We saw them in chapter 2 of Numbers. And to the south side, Reuben. Reuben is the one who is the water. The man, water. And it is the Lord here as Reuben. And he shall pour the water of his buckets and his seed. His seed. Look at this. Sowing time. But what does it mean? Posterity. His posterity. And what? Child. Who are the children? Who are God's children? Who are the children of the Lord. All right? Look at this word for seed. Okay? Offspring, descendants, posterity, children. Listen to this. Remember we talked about righteousness? A practitioner of righteousness. What? Remember we said we're the, the remnant group, the Smyrna, that remnant group, the, this new priestly line will be the the children they are the children of God co-heirs with Christ they're the little lambs little rocks and we saw from Gen from Genesis 7 verse 1 practic pr practitioners of righteousness because everybody going pre-trib is that connection as well but the remnant from among them will serve him in his posterity as children of God who are among the righteous practitioners we see in John chapter 4, remember? John chapter 4, lift up your eyes. Sound familiar? And look on the fields. They were white already to harvest. That's the white of the, of the blossoming buds of the almond tree. He that reapeth re receives wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together how about genesis chapter one how about we go back to genesis chapter one did you see what it said in numbers 24 he shall pour out of his buckets his seed shall be in many waters pour water out of his bucket his seed shall be in many waters well his seed is that remnant group right his seed is that remnant group let me finish this first. We've talked about this a number of times. 
in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hello. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That we are what? The children, the posterity, the children of God, the practitioners of righteousness. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with them, that we may also be also glorified together. This is that remnant group from the pre-trip. They are co-heirs with Christ, children of God, led by the Spirit of God, who are called the sons of God. Well, that brings us to Genesis 1. <clears throat> Look at this. In the beginning. Isn't there a group connected to the beginning? Did we just see that? A group connected to the beginning? In the beginning, in Christ, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And listen to this. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. How much more clear do we have to make this? How much more clear? This, it, it gets ridiculous. <laughs> it gets excitedly ridiculous how crazy this gets. Isn't that awesome? It is proving to us it's directly related. Just like we said in Revelation chapter 3, we're right now in the Laodicean age. We're coming to the very end of the Laodicean age. And the third to last verse says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This is that point that we said. This is a, a picture a, a prophetic picture of the end of the is Laodicean age when the Lord will come and make known, as he said in Luke chapter 12, after verse 35, that to be ready when he returns from the wedding, that when he knocks, they would open unto him and he will come and sit with them and serve them. We know that this only takes place in Luke's discourse. I mean, in uh, Luke's gospel at the resurrection in Luke chapter 24. It's the only group, the two that were walking on the road to Emmaus. They represent the end time uh, um, Elijah John company and the Moses company. Those are the ones of the end of days. Right? Just like it was Moses and his brother Aaron. Aaron was the priestly line. John was the priestly line. They're the Elijah company of the end of days. This is who he's talking to, the remnant bride portion. And when it's all over, and they're going to take part. They're going to be resurrected, having put their necks on the line, and be resurrected to rule and reign with the Lord. Then we come to the end of the Laodicean age of the is to come when the Lord is returned, feet down on the Mount of Olives. And what does it say? To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his. Boom. It's crazy. It's so perfect. Look at what we saw in the connection to John chapter 4. That they may rejoice together. This is that group that I was just talking about. Look what happens if we go look at this definition for rejoicing together. It's found in John 4.36, John 20 verse 4, and John 21 verse 2. For anybody that's been around for a while, you know that this, in chapter 20, is the prophetic picture of the beginning of the 40, uh, sorry, the beginning of the 50 days. And look at what it says. So they ran both together. Both. So they ran both together. Who are the ones that ran together? Well, it's a prophetic picture. It's the same typology as the one from Luke. Right? Luke chapter 24. There were two on the road to Emmaus. 
I'm not saying it's the same two people, but it's the same picture of there being two. Who is Jesus talking to this in the prophetic? Who's he talking to? This group right here. When he returns from the wedding, when he knocks, that they would open unto him. It's the same group. It's the same prophetic picture as you guys who have been around for a while have understood that John's gospel, chapter 20, is a prophetic picture of the beginning of the 50 days. And then it goes into Luke 24, the beginning of the 40 days, when the Lord has returned, what? On the eighth day? Oh, wait a second. Let's go have a look at this crazy talk of Alan. Let's go see what he's talking about. First day of the week, early in the morning, that's a prophetic picture of Mary Magdalene. We see they ran both together. This is a picture of the two on the road to Emmaus, the same typology. It's the beginning of the 50 days, and look at what happens. We know Jesus is also going to meet with a group of modern-day apostles at the, and when that 50 days begins. It says he comes back on the same day at evening. On the same day at evening, he returns after he's taken the pre-trib. And he's going to anoint these modern-day apostles who represent the Ephesus portion before Smyrna. <clears throat> and they're going to go out with the power of the Spirit. Jesus will breathe. The Son of Man will breathe. The Lord will breathe the Holy Ghost upon them. And then he's gone to the wedding. And then we don't see him return again till what? Eight days. <laughs> I love it. It's everywhere. And when you see it and understand it, it just keeps blowing your mind. So what is this a picture of? Well, this is a picture, like we just said, of the end of this modern-day Laodicean age when he's going to let them know when he's telling them to be ready when he returns from the wedding. And this is the end of the Laodicean age of the is to come. And what's the end of the Laodicean age of the is to come? Well, in the big picture... It's the end of the seven easy years, like when he worked for Leah before he got her. It's the seven years of seals, the seven years of trumpets. So what is it? It's the 21st year, which is like John chapter 21. We go to John chapter 21, and John chapter 21 is the other place where we see the conversation of the rejoicing together. And in John chapter 21, verse 2, is where we see the conversation right here. And what's it connected to? The 153 fish. Who are the representation of the 153 fish? Well, if you guys haven't seen it, you've got a lot of homework, man. I've been showing you all these teachings to go to. Because this will blow your mind right here. The 153 fish is the revelation of those being resurrected to rule and reign with them and will sit with them in his throne as he sits in his fathers with his who will reign with them during the millennial reign. As Revelation 20 said, they will be the first resurrection on such the second death will not affect them. It's exactly what we see about the church of Smyrna. Okay? He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Why? Because these are the ones putting their necks on the line and they begin their story when the Lord comes as the first and then will be the last. That which is dead and will be alive just like they will take part in. And these are the ones who will put their necks on the line. Some will be cast into prison and some will be put to death. Wild, wild, mind-blowing stuff, guys. It's all right there. Numbers 24. That, that was just Numbers 24, the first verse. In verse 7. In verse 7. So the first blessing that he speaks from the Lord God Almighty is the blessing of the Son of Man as the man with the pitcher of water being poured out his seed, the remnant children, the children of God, the co-heirs, who are going to the many waters, who are the ones who are filled with the Spirit of God, who are the sons of God, when the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. 
When does it begin? Reuben. South. The man face. At the time of water. With the waters and the buckets of water. Which is Aquarius. Aquarius. Every year. Is late Feb, late January, in through January, uh, sorry, in through February, and it's always the month of Shavat. In my opinion, in the revelation of all of these years of revealing, the year that it happens, which I believe will be this year, it is going to happen in the month of Shavat. Reuben. You want to hear what the second blessing he speaks over him? Numbers 24, verse 8. God brought him forth out of Egypt. Huh. God brought him forth out of Egypt. We know that connection too, don't we? He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn, a wild bull, the ox. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. You guys will remember this. Remember what uh, who Joseph is defined as? Is it uh, numbers? No, is it Genesis or Numbers? Uh, da, 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 da. Joseph. In Genesis 49, remember, Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben Ephraim, same thing. In the last days, we come to Messiah ben Joseph, and what do we see about him? The bow of his strength. Um, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. The archers that were against him, we see the bow of his strength. See, as bending his bow with arrow, he is the Messiah ben Joseph, the Messiah ben Ephraim, connected to the end of days that we're reading about here when he comes as the ox, which is Messiah ben Ephraim ben Joseph. Okay, same thing. I always keep saying it, but you know what I mean. The second blessing is God brought them forth out of Egypt and he did it as an ox, which is Ephraim. And he destroys all of his enemies, all of the nations, his enemies, that had come against his people. Well, we know that that is the ox, which is Ephraim, the bull, and the unicorn. What else do we know? It's the olive branch, right? It's the olive branch. It's the arrows. And it's Numbers chapter 13. I want everybody to remember, I did not make this chart. It's been around for years. I simply downloaded it, and we had a suggestion to put these arrows going around, and our sister Tammy did that for us. We did not make this. But we can prove every bit and piece of it out. Look at this. Numbers 13, arrows we just saw, and olive branch. Well, let me show you one example. In Genesis chapter 8, we have the prophetic picture of the end of the 40 days when the Son of Man came, right, as the Reuben part. Then we see the raven go out. That's when the compassing about of Jerusalem. <coughs> we have the dove, which is the Holy Ghost, at the 50th day, and the dove then leaves after he anoints the remnant workers. Then it says, the dove stayed seven days, and the word stayed is the beginning of tribulation, the official 14 years at the Red Horse Rider starting. And look at what it says. Stayed yet seven other days, which in the end of days is seven years. And when the dove goes out, look at this. Verse 11, Genesis 8. And lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. Olive what? <coughs> Excuse me. Olive leaf, which also means branch. <laughs> what did Numbers 24 say? Numbers 24 which we know is connected to the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. It's connected also, which is Ephraim, 
which is an olive branch or the branch, right? The leaf, the leaf branch plucked off the arrows of Joseph. And, oh, let's not forget Numbers chapter 13, which is where four and a half years ago, the revelation of Taurus began. Watch this. Numbers chapter 13. Check this out. We see from the tribe of Ephraim, there's Judah is Caleb, and from the tribe of Ephraim, Hosea, the son of Nun. And look what Moses does. Moses calls Hosea, the son of Nun, Yeshua. He changes his name to Yeshua. Ta-da! Right? This is, this is right near the end. Prophetically, is a picture towards the end of the sixth year of seals. Well, do you remember what happens at the end of Deuteronomy? At the end of Deuteronomy 34, didn't, didn't they dwell in the wilderness? Didn't we, haven't we shown that they flee into the wilderness here in Mark's discourse, the abomination of desolation in Mark, when they flee into the wilderness, like in Numbers, and they stay there until the end of the sixth year of seals at the coming of the Lord, on Mount Zion, which is paradise, which will they, they will have seen coming before they get to be taken in the mid of great multitude. What do we know? It's a prophetic picture of the time with Moses and them fleeing into the wilderness. That's the one from Mark's discourse. They're fleeing into the wilderness, and they're there until the coming of the Lord at the end of the sixth year of seals, and they see him coming on Mount Zion. Who's the one that takes them over into the promised land? Did Moses get to do it? Nope. Moses died. Moses died. What happened to John the Baptist? John the Baptist died, right? He was beheaded and then Christ took over. The Elijah company, some will die, right? And some won't. And in the Elijah company, with Elijah, he says, all of them are dead. All of the prophets are dead. And it's only me left. And he went up in the chariot like the great multitude rapture. They're going to be taken alive, right? For those who have, who have made it alive. But who takes them there? It's not Moses. It's not the, the Moses-Elijah company that are going to take them into the promised land. It's Joshua chapter 1. We find out that it's Joshua, Yeshua, the son of Nun, who is going to take them over the Jordan into the promised land. Who is the one taking them over into the promised land? Ephraim, the ox. What did Numbers chapter 24 say? It also went on to say that he's going to destroy the enemies. When he comes as the ox at the end of the sixth year of seals as the unicorn, when he brings them out of Egypt, the same prophetic typology of bringing them out of Egypt from when they fled into the wilderness at mid seals, when he comes, he will bring them out of Egypt, out of the wilderness. He is the ox of Ephraim. And what is he going to do? He's going to destroy all the enemies. Wasn't well, that exactly what we talk about in, um, in uh, Ezekiel 39? It's the Ezekiel 39 war that we have shown many times, right, on the charts. The Ezekiel 39 war is going to happen at the end of the sixth year. We've seen it right here. It's Ezekiel 39, the end of the sixth year. <coughs> the Ezekiel 39 war takes place. The whole world of prophecy believes the Ezekiel 39 war is coming first. And then the seven years of tribulation. That's because they haven't understood, as we said, the differences in the Gospels and who they're speaking to. Many Jews believe the same thing. That it's a battle. Messiah is going to come and destroy all their enemies and then the temple is going to be built. But there are some that know something else comes first. We're going to talk about that in a moment. We see the same story in 2 Esdras. Right? Most high will deliver those who are upon the earth. That's the pre-trib. Bewilderment of mind. Everybody's going to be in confusion. Right? Having been caught off guard. And then they're going to plan to make war against one another. The red horse rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. 
then all the signs of those things and everything that will take place in seals. And then my son will be revealed. And an innumerable multitude shall gather together, as you saw, desiring to come to conquer him. That's the exact same time. It's the end of the sixth year of seals. And he shall stand on Mount Zion. And Mount Zion shall be made manifest to all people, prepared and built. As you saw, as I said earlier, the mountain carved without hands. You see? So they're going to see it coming. And then what? Then he's going to assemble them to himself. Second Ezra tells us the same thing. It's the same story. Sorry, my cursor's glitching. It's incredible. So this is what? This is the second blessing. And it's Ephraim. Well, what's the third blessing? There has to be one more, right? There has to be one that relates to Judah, the lion. <clears throat> well, Numbers 24, verse 9. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. Balak, right? This was the king, the beast, the false, the, the antichrist. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, who is the false prophet, but was given the words through the Lord God to bless over Israel. And he smote his hands together, and Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. <clears throat> In fact, that's going to be tonight's title right there. These three times. Bam! They're, Eph uh, they're Reuben, Ephraim, Judah. You see now? You see why I'm excited? When I saw this, I freaked out when I caught that with Reuben. Built on what we had already taught with all great truths, begin as blasphemies. And at that point, I knew. In my heart, this is it. In my mind, in my spirit, this is it. It's Aquarius, brothers and sisters. End of seals end of trumpets and what remains there's the eagle so then who can the eagle be <clears throat> that's kind of a question that remains right who's the eagle well before we get to the eagle i want to share a few minutes of this which is a, a, a teaching from a rabbi that was shared with me uh, i think by our brother roy and again <laughs> It's awesome. It's awesome. Wait until you hear even just the, what, the first 30, 40 seconds here of, of this first piece. Listen to this. Nell tells us about that particular word. Okay, fine. She says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem's going to be full of Jews at this point, which it is right now, and we're going to find refuge there, and it's going to be holy, and the house of Jacob's going to be built over there. That means, by the way, it's a different opinion Listen to this. whether the Beit HaMikdash will be built before or after this event. We know that one of the jobs of Mashiach is to build a Beit HaMikdash, but some say actually it's going to start to be built beforehand and then finally built by Mashiach himself. <laughs> Did you hear that? Most Jews aren't in agreement with this because they believe when Messiah ben Joseph comes, right, and we know Messiah ben David will be there, that they're going to rebuild the temple. We know it's not going to be Messiah ben Joseph. It's going to be Messiah ben David, right? We've proven that with scripture. But they believe that it's connected to the timing <clears throat> of when Messiah ben Joseph comes, right? That then the temple will get rebuilt. And we know that. We have proven that when the Lord returns at the end of the sixth year of seals, he cleans up and does what he does in the seventh year, as we've taught. And then at the start of the eighth year of tribulation, the beginning of trumpet judgments, they will rebuild the city and the streets and the temple for the first three and a half years. But what do we know comes first that we have taught on over and over and over again? In the first half of seals, in the time in the midst, midish portion of seals, 
they will get the foundation of the temple laid, but they will not be able to build anything else until the Lord comes. And what is he saying? That there's a group of rabbis, these ancient rabbis and these guys, very predominant, that have spoken about this. Now, we know that Messiah is going to rebuild when he comes. But these guys talk about it appears that a portion of it is going to be built before he comes. Yeah, exactly. But do you know why so many rabbis have an issue with it? Because they can't understand how that could happen if Messiah is coming soon. And the next thing that's going to happen is he's coming to destroy all the enemies around Israel right now. It's because the rabbis, like the Christians, have no idea, the vast majority of them, have no idea that Jerusalem is going to be attacked and destroyed and removed from the land first. And in that removal, a small group will be allowed to go back to begin to rebuild, but they will only get the foundation done. And this guy can't comprehend that. He goes on and he starts talking about, oh, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> it's awesome. It's so awesome. This is, it's like I taught in the other video, uh, um, all great truths begin with, uh, uh, begin as blasphemies. It's, we talked about that with that other young rabbi. We can show the missing parts that some rabbis see and some don't believe it and some can't understand it and some see here and some see there. We can do it with the rabbis. We can do it with the church. This is how blessed we've been to understand this revelation, this entirety of this seven and a half years. It is absolutely incredible. Well, let's go on now a little bit further. Listen to a little bit more that he says. And I, I literally, we've talked about it with Mark. We talked about it at the, in Second Esdras at the coming of the Lord on Mount Zion. Right? When he gathers the other group, who's going to be the one doing it? The ox, the Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben Ephraim, same guy, right? Well, let's see what these guys have to say about it. Let's have a little listen. So now we're going to have to go deep. So I need you to focus with me for a few minutes, <laughs> love it. and then we'll finish this off. It goes like this. We know that there was a split. When the Assyrians came to Israel, there was a split in the kingdom. Okay? Ten tribes went one way and were, as far as we know, lost to history. And the other tribes that we have, right, were the Jewish people that we still have today. We have a promise, and this is one of them, by the way, but others from the prophets, that the tribes of Israel are going to return. That's the church. And they are headed by Ephraim, <laughs> by Yosef. Right? His See, the Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben Ephraim, when he comes, he is going to lead the lost ten tribes, which is the church, the Christians who will have survived and made it alive, he is going to be the one to lead them back, which he's going to lead them, though, to paradise that he is coming on. Father, from that group, where are these tribes? So this is a big question that I am personally fascinated with. There are many people alive today from various nations who say that we are from the original cast of the 10 tribes from the northern kingdom <laughs> of Israel. What we have today are the Jews from the temple. There are groups in Ethiopia, right? There are groups in India, right? You say they're from Manasseh. There are many different groups around the world who claim, and some who don't claim, but probably are, or possibly are, from these 10 tribes. One of the jobs of Mashiach, actually one of the things we're going to see before, during, and after Mashiach comes, is the return of these lost tribes. Now, each one of these two groups has a leader. One person who stands out. From the group of Yaakov, it is... The Jews. Judah. Mashiach ben David. <laughs> Mashiach ben David. He's going to be the leader, right, who is going to stand up from the Shevet Yehuda, right, Judah's the tribe, and he's going to stand up, and he's going to be the final redeemer for the Jewish people. That's the Messiah ben David, right? The one who will lay the foundation. He's the one that we say is a man who's here, who has to be alive. If this is the, 
the the generation, the time. He has to be alive. I've told you who I believe he he may be. He has to be alive. Listen to what he ends up describing. And then the Messiah, Ben Joseph, is the one who brings in the lost tribes, whereas the other one is the Jewish from the tribe of Judah, and they're the ones. One brings in the lost tribes and heads them. Well, that's exactly what Jesus said. I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see? And the Messiah, Ben David, is the other one. He's going to oversee the rebuilding of the foundation. And then when Messiah, Ben Joseph, Jesus comes on heavenly Mount Zion, they will together rule like Zechariah says, and Messiah ben David is going to complete the temple, and they'll rule together, but the Messiah ben Joseph is the greater because he is the high priest and king, not just the king that is going to be shared between the two of them, but the high priest king is the greater because he's directly connected to the Father. That's Messiah Jesus. But how about the leader from this other group who are somewhere out there, or maybe they're with us, maybe they're really starting to, we don't know. And this I don't funny. know, so do not ask and do not send me emails on this because I don't know. I like this. I don't know. You know why? Don't send me emails. Don't say anything about, you know why? Because he already knows they're Christians. It's, it's the believers in Yeshua Messiah, right? In Jesus. That's who they are. That's why he's like, don't, don't send me anything. Don't send me any of your comments. He's already heard it before, right? But, the comments are crazy, but we do know what that leader is called. Mashiach ben Yosef. Hmm. So let's go into this for just a couple of minutes. You may have heard that expression before, and the rabbis, the Gaonim, and others speak about this leader called Mashiach ben Yosef. And there's tradition in the more Kabbalistic writings, and actually see this in a lot of Sephardi Sidurim, the ones that have a lot of extra commentary, that one of the prayers we make actually in the Amidah is that Mashiach ben Yosef should not die at the hands of someone called Armilus. We heard that last time. Right? Who is that? We don't know. Maybe it's a gematria thing. Maybe it's a name thing. Maybe it's a meaning thing. I don't know. That's above my pay grade. But we know that we want Mashiach ben Yosef to survive. And we know what he... that means, right? He's at the same place as that young rabbi. That some believe he won't die. Some believe that he will die. It's because one sees at the end of seals and the other one is seeing at the end of trumpets. They're both true. May die. Because he's going to come before Mashiach ben David and get stuff ready for Mashiach ben David. That's the Mashiach's arrival. So according to that, Mashiach ben Yosef is an actual leader who's going to bring a lot of these nations back. Because remember, he's going to be the flame. But Yaakov, that's the fire. It's going to finally really wipe out right? the house of Esau, specifically Amalek. Yes, so we know saying. that's his job. So we have these two people well, one has to be a person. Mashiach ben David, that's a given. He's a person, normal, flesh and blood, married, kids, Talmud Chacham, and he has... Look at that. Did you hear that? We know that one of them has to be a human, flesh and blood, man, married, kids, the Messiah ben David. That's exactly what we've been saying this whole time. The Messiah ben David is somebody here. He is, he is a person here now. Because he's going to be the one laying the foundation. He's going to be here during seals. He has to be connected to the, Zerub, the, the Zerubbabel type. He is from Judah, born in Babylon. I've got my beliefs into who I think it is. I've said it before. Now listen to what he says about the Messiah ben Joseph and what writings say about him. Various things are all to do. That's the Mashiach we always speak about. But how about the Mashiach ben Yosef? So some say, yeah, he's going to be a normal person as well, and he's going to be doing a lot of fighting before Mishap and Dava comes to get things ready. I will, however, tell you about one opinion that I read an essay on today. But I'd heard this and read it before in short, but I saw the whole thing. And this is Rav Cook. Rav Cook was one of the great rabbis who live in Eretz Israel, considered to be one of the great leaders of the Jewish people. He says that Mashiach ben Yosef since it's not really mentioned explicitly in Tanakh, does not need to be a person. He can be an epoch, a time. And what he says in actually a speech that he gave, I believe, at the Hesper, the eulogy for Theodore Herzl, okay, that's where he actually went into this a little bit deeply, but we'll leave that aside. He actually said that Mashiach ben Yosef is not a person, it's a time, and what, was, what he saw was the fledgling Zionistic movement, secular. He got a little bit of secular. trouble for saying this, okay? But he was a great man, and I happen to agree with him. 
he saw the return of the Jewish people under this secular leadership. Aha! Okay. You see that? Messiah ben David we know is a man. Messiah ben Joseph we know isn't a man. We know it's the Lord coming. It's not just an epoch of time. But overall it is. It's the epoch of time since the Christians have been around. They are the lost tribes of the house of Israel. And they will be brought back through Messiah ben Joseph who is the Messiah coming back. He's not a man but Messiah ben David is. And this is why, you know, he's getting, he was getting in trouble because of secular. Yeah, it's the Christians being that will be brought back. And it will be when Messiah ben Joseph comes, which is the mid-trip great multitude rapture to Mark. You see how awesome this is? You see how crazy it is that we can discern and bring about this, this revelation? It, it's exactly what I was showing right here in 2 Esdras. Same thing. It's this time here when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion and then he'll gather the ten tribes. <laughs> when he's coming with the place prepared and built. See, they see it first before he gathers them. It's awesome. It's so incredible to see. Now, let me finish this up. As we go into what about the eagle? And I'm not going to go too far down this road because we'll, we'll build on it and we'll understand it a bit more. But remember, the three comings have nothing to do with the eagle. They're the man, the ox, and the lion. So what about the eagle? Well, the eagle isn't mentioned as Dan, but we know the overcomer is the eagle, and the serpent is the scorpion that remains on its belly. Well, I'm going to propose something pretty wild, but there, there's two options still, okay? Listen to what it says. We know that this is mid-trumpets. Okay, this is about ten and a half years into tribulation when Satan loses his battle in heaven and is cast down to the earth. Well, doesn't Satan have wings? Satan has wings, doesn't he? Hello. Satan had wings. Lucifer had wings. But Lucifer already fell. His wings would have already been cut, right? Lucifer already fell, brothers and sisters. Some people wonder, how could Satan, who had fallen, be in heaven still accusing us before the Lord? That's because Satan wasn't the one who's been cast down yet. It was Lucifer. We've shown there are three separate. It's the beast, the false prophet, and Satan. The false prophet, uh, um, uh, Lucifer, is the beast and satan is of course the devil and he still has his wings he hasn't been cut down yet look at what we see in revelation chapter 4 we see the four beasts around the throne right what do they have six wings they have six wings each we go to isaiah chapter 6 and what do we see there's the seraphim, right? Who are the seraphim, brothers and sisters? Right? Satan is a seraphim. Right? Let's go to it. Uh, where was I? Isaiah 6. Look at what the seraphim are described as. See? Like fiery serpents, right? Fiery serpents. But they have these different faces. And if these are around the throne of God the Father, father god the father and the description isn't just like this a fiery serpent but the color is as copper right it's the description of satan himself remember the serpent the serpent that beguiled eve the serpent the snake the hissing one what was he Nakash, he is a seraphim. Satan fell from one of the seraphim around the throne of God. But but what about Lucifer? Lucifer is not a seraphim. Lucifer is a cherubim. Remember that? Lucifer is a cherubim, and the Son of Man has four around his throne as well. But what are they? 
They're not seraphim. They're cherubim. The cherubim. Let's go to Ezekiel 28. And we'll see in Ezekiel chapter 28. The difference with the cherubim. Okay. The cherubim. The cherubim. We're going to see the explanation of the cherubim. There's the cherubim. The cherubim are the ones around the throne of Jesus. And the cherubim have what? Four wings, it tells us. The cherubim have four wings. The seraphim have six. The cherubim, who is Lucifer, the one that was the brightness of his coming, <coughs> the one that was, sorry, of the brightness, right, that was all beautiful and everything, he was already cast down. There's a reason why Satan is still in heaven accusing us. How could he still be there accusing us? Because it wasn't Satan that was cast down. It was Lucifer. Which means there's still one there that's like an eagle. One there that's like an eagle. Has the wings, right? Like Genesis chapter 4. There's still one there. And he's still accusing. And he's going to be cast down. And these four, four beasts each had six wings. Watch this. I did a Google search. Uh, so we know the seraphim are around fathers, which is Satan. And we know the cherubim are around Jesus. And that was Lucifer. One from each fell from around their throne. So watch what happens. I did a word search. Where is it? What, which one? Where is it? Oh, I don't know where it went now. <clears throat> and it showed, though, that, yes, there's one, uh, there's the, the cherubim are around Jesus' throne, and the seraphim are around the Father's throne. So when we're in Revelation chapter 4, are we seeing cherubim or are we seeing seraphim? We're seeing seraphim. We're seeing seraphim. Because Satan's still there. If three of the four are Christ, and this one isn't, and there's still one who is Satan that needs to fall from the Father's throne, who is going to be cast down, who is what? Like a serpent who is cast down, but there's still an overcoming side, which represents Dan, the eagle, uh, the eagle that didn't overcome, right? That fell. He's the serpent being cast down at mid trumpets. And what do we know happens at mid trumpets? At mid trumpets, we come to Revelation chapter 12 and we see when that old serpent called the devil and Satan was cast down unto the earth. If he is cast down unto the earth as a serpent now, do you think maybe his wings were clipped? Do you think maybe some wings were clipped? This is my hypothesis. Because look at what comes up. Okay? He knows that he's now got a little time. He's been cast down to the earth. He has but a short time. And what happens? And when the dragon saw that he was cast down to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, and to the woman were given. She didn't fly away on an eagle. She was given two wings of a great eagle. She was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Who, who was the eagle? Is it possible that the eagle <clears throat> was Satan and having not overcome, being cast down now, his wings being clipped, having had six wings, two of them are given to the woman that she can fly away on the wings of a great eagle? <clears throat> pretty wild thought, isn't it? Isn't that pretty crazy? Once you understand the difference, Luke, Mark, Matthew, right? Once you understand pre, mid, post, all these things happening in threes, you also realize that it's 
Lucifer, the false prophet, and Satan. Well, let's have a look at this. In Psalms 91, as we're close, we're just bringing it to the end here. It says in Psalms 91, verse 4, He shall cover thee with his feathers under his wings. Okay? Well, this is a covering under the Lord's wings. Okay? So we're seeing a picture also of the Lord being like an eagle, like the Father being an eagle. Well, look what happens <clears throat> when we go to the Hebrew Strong's number 84. Okay? 84 connected to Psalms 91, verse 4. Listen to what it says. Okay? From the eagle's wings. Okay? The feathers of the Lord. The eagle's wings. Metaphorically of God. So is it God who is the eagle and is going to fly them away? Maybe. But they're not flying away on an eagle, nor are they under the wings of an eagle. It said two wings are given to her that she might fly away like an eagle. And they're, they're being given to her from a great eagle. You go look up the, the scriptures that say a great eagle, and you'll see its connection in the storyline going up into the high cedars and clipping out down a branch and so forth. But we see that it also is metaphorically of God. But if we go one more over, to the Hebrew, uh, to the Strong's Hebrew word 83, which is also in relation to the wings. You see, wings, dove, eagle, all of that. It's also figuratively connected to a Babylonian king. So you've got the wings connected to the God, to God the Father, and you've got wings connected to the Babylonian king, like the enemy, like saying with uh, Satan here. So when we look into this and we go to Isaiah chapter 40, let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. Listen to what this says. First of all, this is really cool. You should go read Isaiah chapter 40. Prepared in the wilderness. It's like the building up through seals and coming to the end of it and going up to the high mountain. Listen to this verse right here. In um, let's start in Isaiah 40, verse 10, as a little side note. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work is before him. You see, he's still got work to do going into trumpets. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. When he comes at the end of seals, he is the shepherd, and he's now going to receive his flock, right? The, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Listen to this. And he shall what? He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom. Who are the lambs, brothers and sisters? They're not the lost sheep. The lambs are the remnant workers. See how awesome that is? Now, watch this. We come down to the end of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord, shall he renew their strength, that they, sorry, renew their strength, they shall mount up, okay? They're going to go up with wings as eagles. See what's happening? It's the same conversation as Revelation 12. They're going to mount up with wings as eagles. They're not flying on an eagle. They're not under an eagle's wings. They're being given wings so that they themselves can fly away. That sounds to me more like Revelation 12 to the woman were given two wings of, of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Where are these wings coming from? From the eagle? who had them clipped finally and is cast down to the earth as the serpent and the wings are given to the woman to fly away into the wilderness for the final three and a half years while well, Satan knows that he now has two and a half years and the pit is opened and who's coming out of the pit but 
Lucifer, and all the ones that were down there. That's why mid-trumpets is going to be the craziest time on earth ever. And this is the point in which the, the ox, Messiah ben Joseph, will fight against them for two and a half years and then die, but as we know, immediately after, be resurrected and return feet down on the Mount of Olives as the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is why he's not the eagle. That, that version, why isn't he all four? Because of the four around the throne, one fell. Just like the four around his throne, one fell. The one around his throne, a cherubim that was Lucifer. And the one around the father's throne is the seraphim, which was Satan. His wings are clipped and he's cast down to the earth. He now has two and a half years to go after them and destroy crazy. And when the Lord returns in that final 14th year, as we saw in Luke chapter 4, Satan says, all these things were mine, given to me in a moment in time. And it begins the 40 days of the story of Noah as Matthew chapter 24. Do you understand how crazy this is to know? How just absolutely mind-blowing this is? I keep saying it, but I, I, I shake my head every day. I still, I give praises to the Lord. I am grateful every single day because my mind is continuously blown. Let's finish off with this. We see this again. In Exodus chapter 19, which is the prophetic end of days at the end, right? And Moses went to God, uh, verse 3, this is the children of Israel, to Jacob, verse 4. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. What did he do? He raised them up. He bare them on eagles' wings, but was it him? No, because to bring them to himself. If he's the one bringing them in on his wings, then they would already be with them. He bears them up on eagle's wings. He raises them up on eagle's wings to bring them to himself. Well, where did the wings come from? I submit the exact same thing I just said. The seraphim, Satan, is cast down because his wings are clipped. And two of these wings are given to them to fly away at mid-trumpets into the wilderness to a place protected for the final three and a half years while Satan and his gang of cronies have two and a half years to make war against the two witnesses, against Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben Ephraim, after the temple had been built. And then the pit is open. They go after them. They make war for two and a half years. They kill them. They resurrect, and the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives as the Messiah, uh, uh, sorry, as, as uh, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, when the whole world will see him from one end unto the other. And it will be the final year of Noah, which is why, Luce, uh, which is why Satan is there, like I said a moment ago, in Luke chapter 4. And when it's all over, it's like Luke chapter 4, when he then pronounces the Jubilee. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. I pray you are able to track and follow through. This is worth taking your time to study. Seek it out. Search it out. Understand it. Pray over it. And realize that the first blessing is the man with the water Buck, the bucket of water. And it is the time of Aquarius to Reuben at the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days when the almond blossoms will bloom and his remnant workers, the priestly line that will be resurrected to rule with him as priests and kings will be chosen and sent over many waters. And his return at the end of the sixth year of seals is Ephraim as Messiah ben Joseph. And when he finally returns immediately after the tribulation of that 13th year, he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives 
These are the three blessings over Israel, over his people, which includes the house of Israel and the house of Joseph, the, the house of Judah, and his priestly line of remnant workers. Awesome. So awesome. I am so grateful, Lord. Whew. <laughs> you know, then when it hits you sometimes, man, I'm so grateful. It. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for leading us into all of this. I'm so grateful. I will continue to do as I'm led, and I will continue to bring forth the revelation for as long as you'll have me do it. I love you. I love you guys, brothers and sisters. I pray for you. I pray for your families. We'll see you soon. Very, very soon. I love you. God bless you all. Bye for now.